And we're live. I am so excited that you guys are joining me today. Thank you so much. I am here with Matt DeBara, and he is a fourth generation Mason. And oh my goodness, let me tell you, their company has been in business for over a hundred years. Imagine all the years of all the wisdom drifting down into Matt, who's now the owner of DeBara Masonry. And I've got him on the show today, and he's going to share with us some reality tips on what we do with all the extra stuff that is left over after you finish a home renovation project. So today we're going to be talking about the stuff that Matt is really aware of, which is going to be all the extra pavers and paver stones. And if you have extra debris and how we clean up the dust, all the stuff that everybody asks. And we're like, oh my gosh, what do we do with all this stuff? And Oddly enough, a lot of people don't do anything with it because they don't know what to do. So Matt is here today and I'm super excited. So please help me welcome Matt DeBara. Hey, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a blast. I'm really looking forward to it. Well, so am I, because I must get the question asked three or four times a week, like what kind of vacuum should I use to clean up construction dust? And we're talking about this because there are a lot of people that do renovations before they sell their home. And so this is a really important lesson for all of us. So start from the beginning and share with us, if you will, the process of what it takes to book a job, the stuff we're going to need for the job, and then what we do if there's anything left over from the job. And then I want to come in from the back and talk about cleaning up all the debris from that, if you will. Yeah. And when you say book a job, you mean like for my company right now, like if someone calls us or? Yeah. What is the process? So if somebody calls our company right now, we've got two ways. So we've modernized the business. So you can either send us photos and get what's called a virtual consultation where you send us pictures of the project you're looking to have done, or you can have us come out and we can take a look at it. So that's kind of the first part of it. And then we meet with clients on site. We measure, we take notes, we video document everything. So they get like this really cool video where we walk and we point to what we're doing as well as a write-up. And then from there, if they decide to move forward, then it gets scheduled with our scheduling team once they sign the agreement, of course. And then from there, the work gets scheduled, commences, they're assigned a dedicated project foreman. And then that person is like the point of contact so that if on Monday, they're like, don't move the rose bush, then on Tuesday, we don't move the rose bush. So we're not switching people on projects. And then we've got our own internal communication throughout that whole process. Now, when you say that you book a job that way, I'm assuming that you're bidding into that your own equipment and your own tools and buying all the supplies and all this stuff. I need to ask this question because a lot of people will hang on to stuff and say, I already have a whole bunch of extra old lumber and I have some other projects or I have old paving stones or old tile or whatever. Are you going to use their old stuff or are you bringing new stuff? And is that part of your bid? Yeah, it depends on the client. We're in the restoration space too. So there's certain instances where a client might have brick or pavers, or it might have a certain paint that is really difficult to match because it's older and it's left over, but it's good. So there's certain instances where things like that make sense. But for the most part, I like to own the means and the methods. So I'm trying to bid in the right products. And then also there's usually warranties involved. So like if I'm using their old lumber, they're like, Hey, I have this leftover from a job. Sometimes that works, but other times it's a concern regarding us being able to warranty the work. I love that answer. Okay. So then I need to ask the next question. What happens and can you give us instructions if you are going to use the old paint or you are going to use the old lumber or whatever, under what circumstances does it need to be stored properly so that it's not just left out in the weather or left out in the rain or whatever so that you are able to use it and match that paint? I know, for example, some paint can't be left in a hot garage or it can't be left in a repurposed bottle or something else, which sometimes we see and you're like, no, it's expired. It's evaporated. I can't use it. Yeah. You touch on a really interesting point. Like I had one client and she saved these travertine tiles, right? Mm. And they had to break some to redo this electrical lighting. And she's like, I've saved them for 12 years. And she was so excited. The problem was, was that the tiles outside had been weathering for 12 years and the tiles inside have not. So when I showed her the match that we got, we were closer matching her product with new stuff, quote unquote new, than we were with the saved material because it had been inside the whole time. On the flip side of that, like you mentioned, there's the other side of it, which is materials that need to be stored indoors because they need to be protected and climate controlled, like certain woods or paints, right? Usually it's climate controlled is what's important there. And and also UV light. You don't want too much UV light on paint cans. 
and we see people don't do that. And so it's like, oh, behind the shed and we like <laughs> dig through it and then we get the paint can and we're like, I think it's a rock and we'll open it. It's just like a big glob that's all dried up. So yeah, it's definitely important to store it in the right setting for sure. So is your advice for people to store it in a climate controlled environment? And then if you can use it, great. And if not, just expect that as part of your bid, you will include that in the price so that you can warranty the job when it's finished. When you're talking about paint, when I started as a kid, we used to have to do the little cards. Like I would go to the paint store or I'd take a big piece of something and I would go to the paint store with it and I'd be looking at it, matching it. Nowadays with laser matching, we can get really, really close. So with paint, what matters is that barcode. Typically, mm -hmm. it's like I have clients who are like, I got 20 gallons left over. I'm like, I just need the code. So, <laughs> it's like the paint's six years old. We need the code. So with paint, it's usually the barcode is what matters. But then there can be certain flooring, like tile, for example, goes in and out of style. So tile is always good to hold on to some amount, I find. But if it's outdoor weathering, ideally you leave it outdoors. That's what goes behind your shed. And if it's indoor tile, you leave it somewhere where it's indoors. So it's really specific to how hard is it going to be to find this? I have clients that some of them save like generic hardwood flooring, for example. And I feel bad because they've saved it for 10 years, let's say. And I'm like, I have some left over in the truck. We almost feel bad not using theirs. Well, that is fascinating. And I'm really glad for that information. So that helps us, those of us that are storing a whole lot of stuff to make sure that it is in alignment with the job. And like you said, keep the indoor stuff inside and the outdoor stuff outside. And how much of it should we save? You mentioned 20 gallons of paint. What yeah. do you do with 20 gallons of paint if you're not going to use it? It's a big misconception around, I see a lot of clients with good intentions. And for example, I had a client, small paver job. She wanted to like extend this walkway and she saved probably 80 or 90 pavers. We needed about 120. The type of paver she bought, we have to buy a half pallet minimum. She saved no money. I felt bad that she had all these pavers. I'm like, you're going to have the same amount if I build this little walkway. Now you're going to have excess of what you save. We can build another little walkway somewhere. But when it comes to saving material, I think it requires a little bit of planning. Like when you can understand what you're saving something for, it's helpful. If you have a big patio or a big driveway, 10 or 15 pavers, 20 pavers, depending on the size is a good number. If you get an oil stain, you're usually taking out six, depending on how many drops of oil and where it goes. Typically, if it's not going to be a quantity to do the entire project, the savings cost-wise isn't usually there. Well, this has been so informative. Thank you so much. I've learned so much and this is just really awesome. I'm going to leave links in the show notes as well where you can find Matt. And then if he has anything later on that he wants to add to this or if he wants to drop back by and answer your questions, you guys will have a direct link to him there. Thanks again so much, Matt. I appreciate you guys joining in today. This was fun. Thank you, Angela.